Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds. Hopefully, uh, you're having a wonderful June evening. How about that? June 1st. And it, it, it time marches on. We are, uh, you know, we try to do these uh, update monthly updates, and it just depends on how uh, the the first day of the month falls, when it, or when Thursdays fall, because I try to do these lives every other Thursday night, and we are always, uh, you know, welcome you guys in, and we appreciate your uh, continued support of this YouTube channel. I hope you've uh, enjoyed some of the content we've been putting up lately. Uh, I've been doing a lot about water. Uh, the uh, the fountain uh, the video was so popular that we put up, um, and then I did a video on how to build that type of a fountain. And, and a lot of people have responded very positively to that. So I always like to give people a few minutes to join in. Hi, Steve. And from, yeah, the McKell the wife producer, Melanie is in the room and she's back uh, from being out of town. And so I have help tonight, which is wonderful. South Alabama as always CB. I don't know where you're checking in from. What we always try to do um, it is ask you if you would, you know, let us know where you're watching from. That really helps me. You know, um, I am here in the heart of the country in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, so uh, when I'm talking about or answering questions, it really does help me uh, to know, you know, you know, if you're in the north, the south, the east, west, and in uh, just generally where you are whenever we're, we're talking about that. And so we appreciate it when you chime in and let us know that. Um, I, you know, I have my regulars and I've kind of gotten used to knowing where they're from now, but it always helps. Like Steve uh, it reminded me, he's down in South Alabama. So he's a great example of whenever I'm talking, a lot of what I talk about right here in this part of the country, he's already experienced down there um, that, that far south. Uh, you know, birds get started much earlier in their migration and their nesting and everything in the southern states. Um, and the and people to our north, we have, you know, people who watch us from, um, you know, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Rhode Island and Maine. And uh, and so a lot of times they're behind a little bit of what I'm talking about. So it does help me to know that. So do keep in mind that, you know, I'm here in uh, the middle of the country and uh, we welcome the questions. And and uh, hopefully you, if you're not subscribed, you will subscribe to the channel. It's growing. Uh, we, we just topped 5,000 subscribers. Yay! Which is a big milestone in the and for youtube and for me and 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 uh, we really appreciate you guys support and you continued watching and joining in with us and i don't know uh, facebook uh, uh, we're broadcasting there as well tonight so and there's my real regular facebook followers hopefully you're um uh, watching on that platform uh, and and we we really appreciate your support and if you guys are have watched these monthly updates you know that what I typically do is I have some topics here that I'm and I've loaded some slides up that uh, some topics that I'm going to talk about, which are very, very topical for now, uh, as you would think. But as always, I am open to questions because I know you guys uh, have a lot of questions. And if I just do not have to uh, have you know, that on my list or don't think you know, I really am always willing to talk about it. Hi, Bobby from Colorado. I recognize that name. And Denise from Washington State. So well, we're getting we're getting the points of the compass covered. That's good. Excellent. Uh, they, uh, the, we've had a beautiful weather stretch of weather here. It's uh, it was one of the milder Mays toward the end of May. We were really mild, and now it's it's pretty warm here in the first of June and in, in our part of the world. And I was in North Carolina the, uh, a week or so back at. at, at uh, helping my daughter move, um, and now I'm back in town, and, and I couldn't believe how cool it was. And down in southeastern North Carolina, and uh, it, you know, it's just it, there's nothing normal anymore, you know, when it comes to to really weather. And uh, so whenever we talk about normal, we really have to preface it with a lot. And the, and birds are so reactive to a lot of those conditions that that when when we talk about timing of things, uh, the weather can influence them one way or the other. So. Well, June, we'll get get going here. Uh, the the June wild bird update. So, migration is pretty much done. Now there there are always late birds and there are always early birds. You'll, you'll hear me say that a lot. There have to be those you know, birds that uh, 
start earlier and, and come in earlier and there's a birds that filter in late and that, that 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 happens all the time but for the most part spring migration um is has has already moved through and and, and their birds are especially in this area are really well into their nesting cycle the migrant birds the resident birds are already on their second uh, nesting cycle. So i have one customer who's already fledging uh, or uh, they're getting close to fledging his second brood of bluebirds which those birds started really early and i've gotten bluebird landlords that they're just now fledging their first batch of bluebirds so it, it varies in the area hi tj you're in georgia when will the grackling starlings? <laughs> yeah, when will the grackling starlings move on? They are eating all the mealworms. Yep, I solved my bluebird and, and house wren problems by putting up a, a wren guard. Good, good. Uh, well, we don't get to look forward to uh, the grackling starlings really leaving the feeders alone here until August. Uh, they move out into the farm fields and they start, you know, forming their big flocks and uh, or a lot of them for their fall feeding patterns, but. Um, it just depends uh, in your backyard situation whether you're going to have uh, grackle problem and starting problems through the season. And in our area, it's a classic example for gar grackle problems is if you have pines. Uh, grackle love to, to nest in pine trees. And so we do find that people in, in here in the Kansas City region where grackle are, are you know, they're, they're common, but they're not, you know, super numerous. But the people who have problems with them nesting are the people who actually have evergreens in their yard because the, the grackle do like to nest in those those types of trees. And so they tend to have the worst problems with the grackle during the feed, the, the spring the spring and summer nesting seasons. Uh, and they really are, are relieved whenever they move out in the, in the um, fall, which for the fall for them would be August. So uh, where you're at in Georgia, I don't know if that's going to be a little bit earlier. Hope maybe even in July they might move out. But during you know during this this nesting season they will definitely have a, and here the other the other people who get really frustrated with grackle and and not so much starlings this way well yeah starlings too but uh, are, are are those who have swimming pools <laughs> or have big water features because uh, whenever the the baby the the fledgling uh, grackle are pooping uh, they poop in a fecal sac. The adults grab that fecal sac and fly out of the nest, which is smart behavior to take it away from the nest, not draw scent. And they fly out and they like to drop it in water, which is also another smart survival instinct uh, to mask the smell. And people who have swimming pools during this time of year when the grackle are nesting, they, these birds are dropping those fecal sacs in their swimming pools or in their large water features, and it gets very frustrating for them. Um, so that... I don't know if you're having to deal with that or not, but are you just uh, there feeding them? Um, what we always recommend for grackle and, and the nesting season is to basically have two different feeding uh, patterns. You know, you can feed all winter and uh, fall and winter. And in the early spring, you can feed your favorite seed mixes and, and whatever kind of feeders that attend, you, you like. But when it comes to the grackle season, um, we, we recommend in any open tray, switch to safflower because grackle hates safflower seed. Um, if you've got, you got your favorite uh, sunflower mixes and peanut mixes, cage feeders work really well at keeping grackle out. Um, and, and also Niger, they don't like Niger for the finches. That they, they don't like that seed as much. But definitely, definitely stay away from anything that's got grains. And that is millet, milo, cracked corn, uh, some of the cheaper mixes, because that draws those blackbirds and those sparrows. And starting, they love the grains. And so if you stay away from those, stay, feed seeds, sunflower, sapphire, peanuts, uh, you tend to naturally... And hopefully you've got a neighbor who feeds the, the junk stuff and then they'll go to them, you know, and, 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 and they get their bird feeders. So that is kind of a classic recipe for us when we try to, 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 to deal with the grackle this time of year. Archipelago, the starlings have been really bad this year and now they're teaching their babies. Yep. How to, how to hang upside down. You're right. To hang upside down. Soot feeders traditionally have been, you know, and then they still, still do work. They, they do discourage starlings from able to eat suet cakes. Um, they're not foolproof. They don't keep them from eating at all, but it slows them down tremendously compared to a suet cake that they can get full access to on top or, you know, they don't have to hang upside down. They hang upside down, they'll start, you know, they'll wake in it, but yeah, they'll, they'll poke at them like a hummingbird and knock the suet in, into chunks and things like that off. Um, yeah. And they keep passing those genes along and the 
that started me getting smarter and smarter. Oh, Melanie commented. Hi, Melanie. <laughs> this one, that one just popped up. So, okay, so nesting. Uh, we're getting getting into the nesting season. I thought a couple of things that I would, uh, you know, they're, the negative of, of, of course, the nesting season um, is that birds, your bird activity does slow down at your feeders in a sense that, uh, you know, you got territories and so you don't have, you know, you don't have as many cardinals, you don't have as many chickadees, you don't have as many, you know, uh, species that are visiting like they do in the spring and the fall and the winter uh, because of territories. But the, the one of the things you, that you do get to see um, that is so cool uh, this time of year are whenever the adults bring the young in and teach them how to feed. And and and, and I know starlings teaching their babies to feed on on the uh, the soot is a not a great thing. But whenever you like, this is a hairy woodpecker with a young one um, passing food to them, saying, "Look, you know, here, here we go. Uh, yeah, this is where you get the food." And and it's fun to watch them because those young will just beg and beg and beg, and their mouth gaped open, and they'll flutter their wings. And the adults are trying to get them to eat on their own, but they'll grab, you know, seed and they'll they give it to them. And then they'll try to look away, you know, like, oh, you know, no, here, here. And uh, we see that with the with bluebirds and, and mealworms. You know, the, the the young will sit around the mealworm bowl, just beg the adults to feed them. And the adults will give them, you know, a, a mealworm to each one of the young. And then every once in a while, you know, they'll uh, uh, they'll look away and say, no, no, you know, wait, wait, for, try to get them to reach down and get the mealworm on their own. And that's really entertaining. And we're getting to see that more and more. And remember, we, we talk about nesting, um, you know, the resident birds, the birds who don't leave, their reward for roughing out the winters is that they get to start nesting earlier and they get in an extra nest. Uh, at least one extra nest over migrant birds because they they can start so early. Why other birds like Baltimore Orioles are are in the middle of migration? Uh, Cardinals are already pulling off their first nest, and bluebirds are pulling off their first nest. So it's one of the advantages uh, that you get for, like I said, for sticking out the winter months. Whereas those insect eating birds primarily, and they say they end up in Central and South America, and they have to wait till they get back whenever the insect blooms. Uh, happen uh, on their nesting grounds. So they have a lot of insects to feed their babies. Let's see. Young starlings make a lot of noise too. Yes, they are very, very, very noisy. Hello, Ruth Simmons from Missouri. I know you. You're. I think you've got a picture or two in here tonight. Um, the the uh, so there's a lot going on and tied to this. And we and I you know again I I talk a lot. There's a couple of topics that I never want to ever miss talking about. And and water is one. Um, but also when it comes to um, birds, one of the most important things you can do, uh, you know, providing water, but it's native landscaping. And that is your what, the plants that you choose. And I promise you, Mary and I are going to, to do who Mary was on with me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and she is my plant expert and I'm going to have her on and we're going to talk about native plants and, 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 and the importance of landscaping with them. But one of the main uh, things, uh, things that are so important about uh, native plants is that insects uh, are, are adapted to them. And so they evolve with the, with the, the leaves and the blooms. And, and, and so they lay their eggs on certain plants um, and, they, it, and when they hatch, the, the eggs hatch and little caterpillars, those little caterpillars are so important for food. And the reason I've got this picture up here, this is a black cap chickadee nest. And you see the dog hair in there. They, chickadees absolutely love to use dog hair and moss in their nest. But I, I, I was reading an, an old article that had written a long time ago. And uh, I was quoting an article from Audubon. And the, the statistics they gave were that it takes between a, a, chick, a, a nest of chickadees uh, four hungry mouths take 400 to 600 caterpillars a day to raise a uh, a, a brood of four chickadees to to them hat the, the fledging, which is about 16 days. And so over over that 16 days, those chickadees will have removed about 9,000 caterpillars from your yard, and that's just one nest of one of chickadees. And so. Whenever it comes to ornamental plantings in your yard, uh, some of these uh, these plants are dead zones for insects because uh, that, that things like burning bush and and uh, uh, 
the Bradford pears, I think what do they call them now? They, uh, they, they call them something else. Uh, Callaway pears, I think they call them now. A lot of these plants are not uh, suited. They, they do not raise a lot of caterpillars on them because they, 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 the insects haven't evolved with them, so they don't lay their their eggs on them. And, and so some are very specific. You know, oak trees have their own caterpillars that, that, that take advantage of that. And, and uh, a, lot, you know, native, a lot of native plants do. And we need those, these birds need those caterpillars and those insects for that keratin, that calcium to make their, their baby birds grow. So, um, I, I, and we really encourage you to seek out in your, wherever you live, in your state, you have a, a state wildlife organization, I'm sure, uh, that uh, has a website that you can look up your native plants for Ohio or native plants for Alabama. And they'll, they'll have you link to the, the plants in your area that are good for landscaping in your yard. I mean, we certainly have the ones that we favor in our yard. Uh, we're very, we're very fortunate to have the, the Missouri native wildflower nursery here in Jeff Jefferson city, which out in the center of the state that are just a great source for information and the plants that we want to plant. And, and so we really encourage you because if you want those baby chickadees to reach these nests, this is the same nest and those are the same babies um, uh, that uh, that friend took and they're, they're getting ready to fledge now. They're pretty darn close. Uh, these chickadees, they, they need a lot of insects. And I know we, uh, we, a lot of, a lot of us uh, subsidize with, uh, the mealworms, and this is a, a super close-up shot of a Carolina wren with a, a mealworm, uh, and the mealworms do help. I mean, whenever you're you've got a nest of bluebirds, and uh, you know, but believe me, they're not just going to feed their baby bluebirds or their baby chickadees or their baby Carolina wrens, or and they're not just going to feed the mealworms. They, that will help those those parents have an easy source of of, of insects, but they're going to be picking up uh, bugs all in your yard. I. I was, we were filming one day uh, and we watched this uh, Carolina wren uh, came in, landed in a bush, came out and had a big old grub in his, uh, in his beak. And it, I mean, it was almost like it was too big for him to, to use. And he, he, he whacked the grub on the, on the, the step that he was landed on. Then he flew over into an old watering can that was hanging on the wall under the guy's, under the guy's deck. And he went in there, and sure enough, that's where the nest of the uh, the baby wrens were, and uh, feeding that to them. So they, you know, it, it, if you want to have successful nesting, you they need caterpillars. Definitely need caterpillars, and native plants are a real important source for all of those caterpillars. All right, let's see. TJ says yes. Been watching the starlings and the robins feeding their juveniles. Right? Yep, in the middle of our, my platform feeder. It's amazing that the juveniles, they just don't pick up the mealworms themselves. You're right, TJ. And, it, and they, I've, I've had hilarious stories of people, uh, you know, and and this was back before, you know, uh, cell phone cameras were so prevalent and all, you know, talking about watching the, the, the adult uh, bluebirds around the, the feeder of mealworms and trying to convince the young to reach down and pick them up and, you know, ignoring them and they still keep begging and begging and, and that, you know, it takes them a while to get the hang of it that they, they, they actually pick up the food. And, and you see these, and, and these most birds, I mean, they, most of these adult birds, uh, you spend about two weeks teaching their young, the, the trip ropes and say, okay, here, um, you, here's what we eat, you know, you, you look here, you know, taking them around and, and helping them and feed them a little bit and then teaching them where to eat. And then they leave. And then those bluebirls move back and they, they, they're they going to start their second nest. Um, and that's very typical in most birds. Uh, now, one of the things that I was going to talk about tonight is uh, about 3% of the birds um, it, it, that we have and it, uh, exhibit what's known as uh, communal nesting and also in uh, cooperative nesting. Cooperative nesting is really, really, I mean, communal nesting we know is, you know, colonies and, 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 and the swallows and purple martins and the several birds that are, that are famous for that. But cooperative nesting is very, very unique. Um, if, if you're familiar with the wolves and hyenas nesting, the young uh, from this year will hang around and help raise the next uh, batch for the next year. Uh, and birds, that's, like I said, only about 3% of birds do that, but there are, there are several birds who will, and they, they do stick around. And this is a Mississippi kite, and Mississippi kites are an example of communal nesting. 
they they are cooperative nesting. Those those young that hatch this year will hang around and help the adults raise the next brood next year. Now, and there you know there's there's other species who do it, and you know the the, the idea behind this is one it increases survivorship of the young that are helping because they're with their adults longer they're learning the ropes better and in in, in wild bird populations people always ask me how long birds live well yeah, most birds young birds die in the first year of life because they're they're not very smart and uh, they get eaten they fly into things they don't survive long enough uh, to really learn the survival tricks that they need. So getting that extra advantage uh, of being with the adults longer is, is good for the young Mississippi kites. And there's one in the, there's, this is a nesting Mississippi kite here in the Kansas City area. And they, they learn the tricks, but then they lose a nesting season themselves to help raise the next year's uh, brood. And, and of course, that's teaching those those uh, young birds uh, important lessons. And so when they do go to nest in the next year, then they will uh, be more successful, much more likely to be successful. All right, Deborah checking in from Bon Terre, Missouri. Joshua from Southwest Michigan. Welcome in, guys. The, the, so are the, and it's not just, raptors you know this is a actually kind of unusual for a, the a raptor to be a cooperative nester um you guys out west uh acorn woodpeckers are, are cooperative nesters and they they stick around and they have complex family groups and and yes the statistics i mean the studies show that it's that the females are more likely to stick around and help but males do too um but i i a woodpecker that i I'm familiar with this from in North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina, the red cockaded woodpecker. I worked on that study on Fort Bragg in which we uh, color banded the legs uh, of these birds when we, we would catch them in their cavities and at night and then we'd get them out and we'd put the color leg bands on them and, and then we would follow them around and we mapped out in great detail where you know th this individual was and it, if it mixed in with this colony versus that colony and which you know which was the alpha male which was uh the secondary male things like that and it's just it's, it's really unique and if you want to read about it it's it's fascinating to, talk, to, to read about but the acorn woodpeckers are another example uh members of the jay family like scrub jays western scrub jays uh the florida scrub jay those guys you'll see them in family groups um, because they do that. They stick around to help raise the young from next year. And Steve, one of our favorites, the brown-headed brown nuthatch is a cooperative nester, which uh, I found really cool. They're uh, tiny little guys. I love them. Um, but they they are a cooperative nester, and they're in that same pine forest that the uh, red cockaded woodpecker lives in. Uh, so interesting that they there's two in that habitat. Uh, so they it, it's it's a great it's a great story, and it's and it's pretty rare. Um, but it, it is a, an, an interesting part of nesting when we think of just, you know, one adult male, one adult female raising. And of course the hummingbird story where the female does all the, all the work, she does the nest building and, and leg laying ra raising and all that. Where in some of these in circumstances, you get a family affair raising the babies, which is really, really cool. So I thought you might guys might find that interesting. Hi, David from Rhode Island. How are you? See, my buddies <laughs> usually show up. At the, that's right. I mean, and that you see these birds travel in these family groups, you know, um, the, and, and, and nut hatches, you know, and not just one. You'll see a little a crowd of them uh, come in. And a lot of times it's these family groups that are, are, are helping to raise and teach the young. That's great. Ryan is from northern Massachusetts. Ryan, I roomed with a guy in college from Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, he was a forestry get student. All right. So, uh, so cooperative nesting. I mean, it's just a, a fascinating subject and I thought that'd be something cool to talk about um, that might not everybody's familiar with. So, um, and of course uh, I, I can't go without talking about water and yes, Ruth, here, here's your pic. This is a picture that Ruth took of a chipmunk drinking out of her water feature and her yard here in Kansas city. Um, and, and water is so important. Uh, we're getting, you know, we, uh, this winter, we talked all about unfrozen water. And during migration, we talk about 
uh, moving water. And that's it. His videos have been up recently about the importance of the gurgling sound and, and, and making it, it, the water easy for people to find. And you guys have been great about chiming in with your setups. And, and uh, some of you have four and five water features, which is amazing. Um, and I understand a lot of you have success with some of the solar uh, fountains that are going now, which is great. Uh, that sound and, and, and the fresh water is so important, uh, not just to birds, but also chipmunks and everybody else who comes up and drinks from them. But we're getting ready to get into the dry season where once again, excuse me, water gets much harder for a lot of these birds to find. So your water features have become more important uh, to them during dry seasons and using things like misters that sprays water that the hummingbirds can fly through. And, and if you, it, it, it's helping, you can, a lot of people will position a mister over their water feature so that, that the mist from the mister is re helping refill uh, your water feature, your bird bath or fountain, whatever you have. Um, and the birds love it. And, you know, the, a lot of people uh, that water this time of year, Wooster, that's it. Yeah. And they, uh, the, um, when they turn their sprinklers on when it's really dry and they're and their sprinklers in their yard and they're hitting their their bushes and shrubs and the birds just flock in there and gather and just let the water drip on them what you know just and uh, basically bathing on a limb that way um uh, which is another great way to uh, to to provide water for birds is just when your water make sure your your sprinklers hit your hit your shrubbery and things like that, that the birds can feel safe in there and and, and enjoy that so and take advantage of it so they, water water for sure so Ron, that's where you're originally from. All right. Yeah. He, he, I think he, 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 Craig ended up settling in North Carolina. We, he and I went to North Carolina State together, and I think that's where he still is today and down there in that area and that part of the world. But he always talked about that. And our other roommate was from the uh, eastern shore of uh, Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. And, and we so we were kind of an interesting crowd, the, our different life experiences and things like that. So all right. Now, another topic that I, you know, I, I always love to address ways you can help birds and water. Like I said, I can't go without talking about water and how important it is. And one other I thought I would mention tonight and talk about is the importance of leaving dead wood. You know, we, we call them snags, standing dead timber. Uh, it is so instinctual for us to, when a, a, a limb dies or especially if a tree dies, is we want to cut it down right away now, and and I fully understand if this tree that has died is in danger of falling and hurting anybody, or falling on your car, falling on your house, all of that. I I, I fully understand that. But if you're in a situation where, um, like, we've got a good little patch of woods behind us, and and I very purposely have left it wild, uh, when a tree dies or a big limb dies out there, I. It doesn't bother me at all. I it, it's a it's a natural bird feeder, and it also is a hotel, you know, for birds. Uh, when the bird when the tree first dies or the big limb first dies, insect attack it, and and it, so there are just tons of bugs under the bark and and burrowing into the woods and laying their eggs in the woods and the and the grubs are uh, hatch to start eating that dead wood. Well, the birds uh, that is food, man. That is a restaurant buffet line for. For many species, of birds, especially woodpeckers, but chickadees, nuthatches, the warblers, lots of birds take advantage of that that, that timber. And as the tree, and, it, and of course, as it begins to break down over time, like this is a uh, had the tree obviously had died a long time ago. All the bark has gone off of it. But then you can really see how many uh, cavities have been drilled into it. So in one tree like this, this is a, a gorgeous uh, pileated woodpecker. Um, but you have nest holes from red bellies, red headed and, and downy woodpeckers. And, and then of course they may drill a hole, not use it. And the bluebirds will move into it or the nut hatches will move into this, a, a smaller hole. And uh, the dead wood is very, very important to, to birds. And we know that, um, you know, the, an early settlement, uh, one of the reasons the bluebird populations declined uh, in the early part of the last century was of course the clearing of dead timber, uh, timber and cutting down dead trees, and before the message could get out to actually leave some dead wood when you can, uh, because it is such an important 
uh, thing for many birds to be able to uh, to nest in and and to find food. So, if you're in a situation, like I said, we all, we definitely understand uh, that you don't. Well, we you know, like when I worked in the nature center world on our hiking trails, if we had a, a limb that died and it was over a, a hiking trail, we had to cut it down. We had to you know go out and 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 cut it down and and because we couldn't risk that falling on people. And, uh, but if it was out in the woods, we could leave it. And one interesting story there is, uh, we had one that a uh, land that had died at, uh, Baroque woods, which is where I worked uh, in when I first moved to Missouri. And we all went out when, and the, the guys doing the tree cutting, we needed spotters. So I went out there with them and we were helping. As soon as the chainsaw hit the limb to start cutting it out, a flying squirrel jumped out of the hole uh, that, that that we really didn't even hardly see and glided across the trail in front of us and landed on another tree and ran up and got lost up in the canopy. So uh, the flying squirrel w- was living in, you know, a, an excavated w- woodpecker cavity in that limb. So, uh, it, you know, not just birds. So, but again, we ha- that was a situation where we just had to cut that limb down and I hated it. But, um, you know, the ones we had lots of acreage, so there were a lot of dead trees out there that we didn't have to worry about cutting. So, uh, if you have that chance, leave those, leave those dead timber that, that leave standing snags as we call them. So, all right, let's see. What do we got? Any more questions, Ryan? Ah, looks like I'm called up. You got it. All right. So, I'm going to open it up for questions, guys. I mean, those are some of the topics I had written down. That you know, I just thought it that you know are, are topical for this time of year, and and we want to you know to help birds. Um, but I know you guys give me updates on your bluebirds. Uh, are you guys on your second nesting? How did your first first nest of bluebirds do? Or have you got hummingbirds? Do you have uh, how about Orioles? Uh, you know, this is the worst Oriole migration season that I've ever had. I swear we we. Um, I, I don't know that we really ever had one Oriole that visited our bus uh, during spring migration. We had a couple of rose-breasted grosbeaks and a couple of indigo buntings visited, but Orioles were, it was just the Oriole migration that wasn't for me. And a lot of my customers, I, I know you guys were talking, you know, in some of our previous ones, uh, our, our lives that, you, you know, your Orioles were very, very late. And I just wondered how it ended up turning out for you. Ryan, how, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, you guys, are, if you guys are getting them, that's wonderful. I we I finally just you know, completely took the jelly in. Um, I have mealworms out every day, but I've not seen Orioles on it. My bluebirds are visiting it. If they can get there before the starlings do, and, and that, which is a tough thing. But uh, the, yeah, my Carolina wren loves my mealworms, but I I have no Orioles. I'm not hearing them at all. I, you know, I go out every morning and I'm listening. Uh, so they're not nesting within earshot of, of us here at the house. I do have a great crest of flycatcher just nesting out back behind me. I hear him every morning, but, um, it's, yeah, it's been, it was a very bad Oriole migration season. So where you guys are, I'm really curious as to what you guys have been seeing. Seeing So David says his chickadees nesting update review of video confirmed dad has last seen on the 13th, four of the original eight hatched didn't survive. Uh, Good. Yeah. Four, the, the, the four fledged on the 30th. Yay. Absolutely. It may, it, you know, the, that was probably two different clutches of eggs. I think probably the first batch of four they had given up on and uh, they, they knew that, I don't know whether it's temperature or, or what, but they laid a whole new batch of eggs and the, those second four are the ones. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got four out of the box. I love chickadees. I saw a male cardinal with a bald head. <laughs> oh, yeah, I could have loaded a picture of that tonight. I didn't think about getting addressing that already. Could it possibly be molting at this time of year? TJ, yes. Um, this is, uh, I've got a whole video on molting. Um, this is, there's two things that can cause this. I wrote an article years ago called Cardinals from Mars, uh, and that is all about the uh, th- these bald cardinals, and you'll see bald blue jays as well. This is another uh, bird that we'll see with absolutely no feathers on his head. And it throws people off about cardinals because the card- the skin of a cardinal is black. So they, they, they see that all that red and then just that, uh, that black head and it, and people get all upset and worried and they think there's something wrong and it's a disease. And um, it can be called by, caused by feather lice. 
but it is much more likely to be what's known as a throw molt. Um, and okay, you know, the head feathers on a bird are for one molt warmth and for and two for show. And at the end of nesting seasons, a lot of times they, you know, they for some individuals will do what's known as a throw molt, and they they literally lose all of those those head feathers. And you'll watch them for the next week and the next two weeks, you'll see all these little pin feathered red feathers starting to poke through uh, and come in. And, and, you know, usually in molt and birds, they just replace one or two feathers at a time. And, and, and this is really important for flight feathers because you can't lose too many flight feathers. You can't fly. But when it comes to contour feathers, those that cover uh, the bird's bodies and their heads, um, it, it really, other than for mate attraction and the keeping warm, and you don't have to worry about this, time, especially if you live in the South, it's really plenty warm for them to be able to survive that. And so he, that bird will be fine. He, he, he will completely, he'll molt and, and those new feathers will come in and you'll never know it. Um, but yeah, that's what's going on there. That is far like more likely the case, uh, whenever it comes to those bald cardinals. All right, Steve watched both male and female northern cardinals and catbirds clinging to our feeder tree, eating hot pepper suet off of it. That's cool. Yeah, that and, and, you know, cardinals. I don't see eating suet very often, so that's neat uh, that they were they were eating that. And, and catbirds, I'm a little more familiar with eating some suet, but the hot pepper suet, excellent. So they're feeding on those suet logs uh, and the and the suet plugs that uh, that we send you down there in Alabama. That's awesome. Bobby Orioles have been visiting our feeders continuously for several weeks now, Colorado Springs, Western Tanagers as well. <laughs> Two beautiful birds, <laughs> Bobby. I <laughs> uh, love those Western Tanagers. And th again, another bird that, that I never had this spring was the, uh, we always have summer Tanagers that nest in our woods right behind the house. Um, and they come to the, to the jelly in the springtime quite uh, regularly. Some years I actually see more, Summer tanagers and I do Orioles in our backyard in the spring this year. No, no, I did not. I, like I said, I, I, I'm, if you, if you guys have signed up for my monthly newsletter, yeah, I saw you, Bobby sent a picture of a scarlet tanager he had visited too, which is a stunning, stunning bird. The, uh, but I, I write a monthly newsletter, uh, uh, email, it's called an email now. And I send that out to all my subscribers um, uh, through the store and uh, people who have registered online for it. And, I wrote in there and it's going to go out here in the next couple of days. Um, but the, one of the things I wrote about was my, my theory on what happened this spring. And I really believe that had a lot to do with wind patterns and in natural foods. And that is um, during what would have been peak migration for this area, we were getting a lot of North wind. So we, the winds shifted and we had some cool day, cool nights and North winds. And I really think a lot of the Orioles and Tanagers and, and cuckoos and things like that, got stacked up to our south down in in Oklahoma and Arkansas and Texas and places like that, uh, you know, trying to trying to journey north, trying to get up here to their nesting grounds. And when the winds finally shifted out of the south, a lot of those birds just flew right over us. They just, they, they were ready, they needed to get to their nesting grounds uh, so they can start the process. And those who did come in, you know, and stayed here and, and, and spent a few days here or nested here, that gave time, that north wind pattern state gave time for a lot of our, their favorite foods to bloom. And that is like uh, black locust trees are one of the favorite foods of, of Baltimore Orioles here in our area. And the black locust blooms were everywhere when the Orioles arrived. So I think those who came in were really uh, fulfilled with the natural foods with the insects and the blossoms that they like and the nectar they like from natural plants. So I think that can uh, actually helped or uh, hurt the the bird feeder people like me uh in that I, my one of my old sayings is if it's good for the bird watcher it's usually bad for the birds and vice versa and i think this year it was good for the birds that when they arrived so it was bad for the bird watchers and being able to see the birds at their feeders and stuff and that and you know it, it some years are like that all right even if the local red tail hawk also putting a dent in the local snake populations that's good and i know barred owls love snakes as well and red shouldered hawks yeah that, that, that's good <laughs> i like snakes i'm sorry I, they're out of you know if i hadn't studied birds uh, you know like reptiles may have been my next field of study but i love those as well david said i thought Get you on water starlings <laughs> what's the big deal yes now i'm pulling my 
fix the mortgage. Oh, we'll be building a Starling Cup this weekend. Yes, and, and, and it's funny, David, uh, you, you saying that. I just had a question on one of my videos uh, from somebody, and she was in northern Ontario. I think she, where she said she was from. But she, you know, she's read a lot of our stuff and, and it, your, you guys' comments and, and their videos and stuff. And she said, I don't understand uh, that people that don't like sterlings and some certain birds. I, you know, and, and, and basically she was saying that she doesn't have problems with them because she doesn't have very many of them. And so I kind of wrote a lengthy reply to her that, you know, that uh, for people who do have problems with certain species, it's usually very specific to, to their situation. And it's usually way too many birds or very aggressive birds and birds are trying to take over nest boxes of starlings and the house sparrows and things like that. And I said, for those who people who don't have those problems, I can understand why they don't understand the comments and things that come in from people who do. So it's, you know, it's very, it, it, just like you said, last year, What's the big deal about starlings? And this year, you really, you know, you know, that's for sure. Oh, Ryan, in terms of starling proof mealworm feeders, do you tend to have more success with the cage models or the ones with holes and clear size? No luck with the latter for under four, four weeks. Ryan, what I have found with the ones you're describing, the ones with the holes on the inch and a half holes on either end and the plexiglass, I, I find that those tend to take longer for the bluebirds to get used to and to go inside. I, I've always said bluebirds are not the smartest birds out there. Um, we used to make one that had a half piece of plexi on one side uh, of the of the bluebird feeder. Uh, and so we would start it with just a half piece of plexi. So everybody, including the starlings could get in there. And once the bluebirds got used to it, then we would take out the half piece of plexi and slide in the full piece and close it up so that only access were the two one and a half inch holes on the end. And that helps kind of speed up getting those bluebirds used to it. Um, but also, of course, the live mealworms uh, uh, moving around in there uh, is important for them to catch their sight. Um, I, I really think probably overall we've had more success with cage versions uh, because it is easier for the, the, them to get in there. I've had those bluebirds bang against plexiglass. They can see the mealworms. And like I said, it, 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 it takes them a while to get used to. So. But eventually, eventually, you figure they'll follow the chickadees in and the, and the Carolina wrens in, which figure them out fairly quickly. But um, it can take a while. Yeah, absolutely. Thinking about dry, trying live mealworms soon. That, Ryan, that'll help a lot. Um, yeah, they, yeah, the live mealworms don't – of course, once the birds find them, they don't live long enough to cook in the sun. They, the live mealworm, once they find them, they'll gobble them right up. And, uh, and the chickadees and the, and the wrens and – uh, but hopefully the bluebirds can get what they need out of that. But I would definitely give live mealworms and then mix in the dried ones with them. That that should speed things up too. All right. Derek says he bought a tube feeder and I've noticed the sunflower chips get clumped up and have to, to tap. Yep. Mm -hmm. The chips will fall down for it. Does happen. Does happen often with tube. It does because two things, uh, Derek, um, Sunflower chips, the kernels don't have a, a hull, so that makes them more vulnerable to moisture. So even humidity uh, can be absorbed, and in that case, they kind of get sticky. And also, the sunflower kernels are, are broken up and very rough, and they they hang on each other versus like Niger that slides and is very slippery. So yeah, I, I when I go out every every day, I take my all my tube feeders that have chips in them. And, and medium sunflower chips as well. And I shake them so that it, it, it make up that space and they all sink a little bit. It's just a natural part of it. Uh, the pros and cons, you don't have to worry about all the holes, but you also get a little bit of the negative when it comes to things like that and it flowing as well. So yeah, that is a, a pretty common problem. Uh, and I don't, you know, it's not serious. I mean, the birds uh, can usually still get to them unless it's, it's several days and they've got a big gap in there, but you just bang the feeder and it falls down. Absolutely. Now, you, uh, when it the the mealworm question, you know, we have got videos, of course, about my favorite mealworm feeder and and uh, feeding of mealworms. But remember, live mealworms are are much better for the birds, especially baby birds. Uh, the dehydration process of drying out dried mealworms takes away nutritional value. And when when we talk about feeding dried mealworms, we always again go back to my topic: water. You need to make sure there's water available 
to the birds that, that, that you're providing that because of dried mealworms, you they, they they may need more more water and the access to water, and they always need access to water. But the dry dry dehydrated mealworms are, are very dry, and they can use more water to help break that down. Whereas the live mealworms have moisture in them, uh, they're gushy, and of course they got the squishy guts and all that, and it and the nutritional value is much higher. So uh, we really recommend if you're if you're feeding uh, mealworms during the nesting season please try to feed the live ones it is it is better and and like i said it's the movement of those mealworms are a magnet to to uh, uh, the adult birds uh, they see that movement and attack them they get used to lot dried ones but the you know having those live ones it makes a big difference during the nesting season for sure all right Penny from Northern Indiana, a little bit late. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, it'll be on there. It'll be available on replay. Derek, okay, thank you. Didn't know if it was. Yep, absolutely normal. It is. David from Rhode Island, I've noticed a whole peanut shortage for my elevated bluebird, blue jay feeder. Have you heard anything? Oh, oh you mean being able to purchase them? Um, we haven't. My, my, my supplier is uh, Des Moines Feed Company out of Des Moines, Iowa. And I haven't gotten anything from them yet. Now, we, we do see this in, in the peanut world. Um, you know, the human consumption market is so strong in, in the peanut world that it does, it, 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 if there's a poor production crop uh, in Virginia or wherever, you know, a lot of the peanuts come from, Georgia, uh, like that, if they, they have some really uh, drought conditions and the peanuts don't do very well, those are years that we will have shortages of the in-shell peanuts. And our, our, our supplier will let us know that, you know, we may be two weeks or three weeks or a month, you know, and, and things like that. I haven't heard anything this year yet, though, David. Maybe out your way, it may be a little bit different. Yep, they, they, they I I love putting out in-shell peanuts for my Blue Jays. They're hilarious. They love them. And if you've ever watched them bury them, it's a hoot. Uh, they, you know, they'll come in and fly away with that, that, that in-shell peanut, and they'll land over in the grass, and they'll look all around. They'll look left. They'll look right. And they'll take the, the peanut and they'll put it down in the grass and they'll reach over and grab a leaf and pull the leaf and put it on top of the peanut and fly out. You know, they, they, they think they're being so, so slick. Uh, studies have shown they don't find very many of them that they plant. Uh, that's okay. Uh, they do the same thing with acorns and they're the Johnny apple seeds of the, uh, the oak tree world, which is great. They, they bury those too. So that's why I don't put out endless supply of in-shell peanuts because I know they're going to bury most of them. So I just put a handful out every morning and uh, and they'll come in and they'll get them all. And then they'll eat other stuff. They'll eat sunflowers and you know, things during the rest of the day. So if you soak the dried mealworms in hot water, they plump up and soften up as well. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. You can rehydrate to a certain extent. They don't get all the nutritional value back, but it does make them softer and, and, and it increases the moisture content. I heard of uh, a really hot water um, in in the bottom of a glass dish, and and just cover that. It, it put mealworms in to the uh, the level of the of the hot water, and let them rehydrate and plump up a bit. You can definitely do that. David Ed's grandson asked you, "We take down the chickadee box?" I would not. I think you're going to probably get a second nesting of chickadees up there. Um, uh, if you have access to clean it out, you could clean it out. I'm sure they use dog hair in, in there and they probably use some, uh, uh, some uh, moss. They, they do love to do that, but I, I, I would clean it out. And the reason, the only reason you want to clean, clean out for sure is in case there may have been feather lice or in some other insect, um, following it, you know, we recommend using gloves, you know, when you go to clean out any bird nest, because of that, and you want to clean it out, and they, boy, they'll have no problem building another nest in there. So, yeah, I would definitely get, give them a chance to make a second nest this year. Deborah says, no Orioles and no Hummers yet. Oh, how far north are you? A few titmice, lots of finches, starlings, and a few mean blue jays. A couple of red belly woodpeckers and nannies. Doves, ringneck morning, and several very dark doves. Oh, those may be pigeons, possibly. If they're really, really dark, ever. Um, I've got Hummers, but uh, that's, you know, like I said, I had terrible luck with the Orioles, but uh, Melanie just said just a little while ago, uh, I just got buzz my hummingbird out here on the deck. So I've seen a male and at least one female, possibly two, coming to my feeder uh, right now. So right now, the, of those, 
the one I'm having really good luck with are the hummingbirds and the goldfinches. So remember, goldfinches are not going to nest uh, for at least a, a, another month. They don't nest until usually mid-July. So they'll still be in the flocks. Now they're going to move, come and go like we talk about with natural foods, the dandelion heads and uh, red maple seeds falling, things like that. They, they're they're going to, so you'll look out there and you won't have any goldfinches for a week. And next thing you know, they're back. Uh, and that's, that's their natural pattern this time of year. Uh, but they are, the nesting really doesn't happen for them until in, in our area, mid July. And, and then, and then of course the females disappear for a month and the males are still coming and, and, and that's going on. So uh, house finches have already had a brood of babies. I've seen those at the feeders and the downies are bringing babies in, chickadees are bringing babies in. So a lot of the resident birds in this area. So it depends on if you're further North, you know, you may be a little bit behind that. So. Let's see. I am in. Oh, you're south of St. Louis. Has anybody noticed there are big blue jays this year? <laughs> Last year they weren't this big. I'm totally new to feeding birds. I tell you, uh, you know the the size really. Uh, there is some size variation in blue blue jays. Um, the the ones in the southeastern United States are actually the smallest blue jays in the U.S. And then and and they get uh, further north. You go blue jays too, do tend to get bigger. This is true basically all wildlife, the uh, larger body size survives better in colder temperatures. So, um, the, but a lot of what goes on when, when our perception of big uh, blue jays or big cardinals or big, is that whether they're fluffing or not. And birds fluff to do both insulate against cold and insulate against heat. So if it's very warm, the, the blue jays and cardinals and other birds will fluff and it'll make them look larger. And then if it's very cold, they do the same thing. And then you'll see them when they're completely slicked down and they look very slim. Um, but there is, there's not a ton of size variation within the area in any individual area. The ones you see, uh, a lot of times, it's like I said, it's just a perception of what they're doing with their bodies. People don't forget to like the video. Thank you, David. And remind the folks to, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, I just get to talk in and, and, but we really do appreciate the support. And, and if, you know, for me to keep doing these things, I have to have, have you guys to support. And so likes and, and shares and comments, all those help me with my status with YouTube. Um, and YouTube appreciates and, and, and when the people are liking and commenting, uh, they, they know this interaction and, and, and it's good for YouTube. So that reflects well on me. So thank you, David, for, for reminding that. I really appreciate that. Let's see. Love using the goldfinches. Love using the hummingbird nesting material I put out. Yeah, well, that, they they'll do that. That that soft downy, put uh, stuff. They love it, and they, putting that out. Remember, never put out dryer lint. Yeah, I talk about that all the time. Do not put dryer lint out as nesting material for birds. It is not safe for them. Uh, just get you know, cotton wool, uh, uh, clean undyed strings, things like that. Deborah Nipper and watch the ads. You're right, Deborah. It really helps a YouTuber if you let the ads play um, when they come through. That you don't have to, if you click on it, all the better. That you know, I know the advertisers love that. But YouTube, if you're watching, if if I'm holding your interest and you're watching, then that helps me out and it helps my position on YouTube and that they promote me more and and get more people. Thank you, Ryan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank. You. I've learned so much from you, your videos, and I'm enjoying birding even more than ever. Excellent, Ryan. I really appreciate that. And he gave us a bump there, and that 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 it helps us out absolutely. Uh, those count a lot toward the the to the algorithm algorithm. Like John uh, David from Rodana commented on that. It, it is all about you know your presence and what people are doing and interacting with you. And we really appreciate that. I did have, you know, we get comments and I, I, I get all kind of comments from all over. And a story that I'm going to share and Mel, Melly's going to laugh at me, but um, the other night I was flying um, back to Kansas City and I was on the airplane and they got on to Chicago and I was flying back to Kansas City. And, was, uh, people, you know, you talk to people around you and then this young lady said, well, really, I, I, I want to change my profession. And she said, I'm a speech pathologist. I want to do something with nature. I love, I want to do something conservation. I said, well, that's great. I'm a wildlife biologist. And, and she's like, oh my God, that's great. And I love birds. And she's got, you know, and we were talking back for this. So well, you might like my YouTube channel. And she looked up at me and she said, you're Mark. <laughs> I was like, 
oh, <laughs> somebody actually recognized me, which I, I blew me away. I didn't didn't expect that. So oh, we bought your videos. We love your videos, and 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 that was a huge, you know, for me that was that was never happened, and and uh, I, I thought that was really great in the power of the internet and and YouTube. So we really appreciate you guys' support, and it's uh, it's. I love talking about birds. I love you know teaching, and I love uh, that you guys learn things from me. And when you guys come and, and, and let me know, you know that I've taught you something, I, I it just makes me feel great. So that's, you know, I feel like that's my mom said I always got the gift of gab, and maybe that's why I, I was given that. So I can uh, hopefully uh, pass on knowledge. So uh, questions? Any? Oh, oh. You're famous. Yeah. That's what my wife said. You know, she said, Oh, you're famous now. I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> but, but it was really great. I, unfortunately, it was a tr the, the, the situation was crazy because the, the, the one girl was getting married out in, in New Mexico and they had got on a train that morning and were going out and the train hit a dump truck in Indiana and they had to get off the train, go to an airport, get a flight. <laughs> they had to fly out there. It, was, it was like crazy for them. They, this, these four people were, you know, trying to get to where they needed to be. It was crazy, but yeah. Hello, Morgan. Morgan wasn't here to do my hair tonight. So and, and then my daughter jumped on uh, from uh, North Carolina. Oh, now South Carolina. She's living in North Myrtle Beach now. So hi, Morgan. All right, Derek, really enjoy these monthly updates about birds. Excellent. Deborah, thank you so much. I really appreciate the the bump. It, 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 I, I, you know, like I said, that means a lot when people... We'll, we'll uh, do that kind of thing for me. Thank you so much. For, you're, you, I, David, thank you. That It means a lot. I, I'm telling you, you know, uh, in doing this for these many years and there's nothing like being somewhere. Um, and, and I was, I remember years ago, I was at the science museum that I had worked at earlier in my career. And this young man who was now six foot six, who's huge, came walking up to me and he just grabbed me and bear hugged me. And I was like, Hi, oh, yeah, hey, how's it going? And I, I recognized him in you know, his face and everything. And and he said, I just want to thank you. He said uh, that, you know, when I was young and I was volunteering here, you really helped me out a lot and you taught me a lot. And I'm, I'm now, he was like the number two hours donator to the science museum there. And he was in the profession. He loved it. And, and it just made me feel good. I mean, I just, that kind of thing, you know, you've had a positive impact on people makes a huge difference. So. <laughs> my granddog's watching Morgan says still with me in North Carolina, North South Carolina. All right. <laughs> yes, Matt, the wife has been calling me Mr. Celebrity this week since the incident on the airplane. So, uh, so yeah, it, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. And you guys, I, like I said, you, you guys who visit with me every week or every other week now, we, we, we do these videos and, um, I, I, I really appreciate it. And I, I, I get ideas from you guys, you know, what do what I want to talk about next week? And if you like say uh, some of you have been really great, you've been um, sending me emails at the store. I've traded emails with, with several of you. Um, <laughs> Steve, Steve being one of them from South Alabama, Mr. Celebrity and Melanie, <laughs> have a great weekend. Absolutely. You too, guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, Okay, Bruce Simmons, you saw her picture of the chipmunk earlier. She just came in and she taught me everything I know about birds. Thank you. Uh, Ruth was one of my first people who ever came on a bird hike that I started when I moved to Missouri years ago. And she's in the best, one of my best friends in this entire world. And and she actually works for me too. So, But yeah, we have birded together all over the U.S. And and uh, we've done breeding bird survey routes the other thing. Ruth, you you are become such a great birder and 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 I, i'm you're one of my prodigies i like to say because you know you really have come a long way and your ears are magnificent and you your ability to to the, the understand what's going on in nature it's uh, i i'm so proud of that you think i've helped you along that much that's great hi yeah. sheila harrison Yes, Melanie. Melanie calls Ruth my original groupie, is what she. And yeah, they were two people that came on those hikes early on, and and they both today are, are excellent birders. And 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 it, like I said, it's it, it it makes me proud. So, thank you guys. I, I again, I I really appreciate you joining in, uh, and I appreciate the comments and the help and and the bumps. I really appreciate a couple of those tonight. That that's great. 
that helps us out so much. And, and, and YouTube appreciates it too. So, um, send an idea for future programs, give us a like, give us a share. <laughs> so I always say at the end of my videos, um, uh, if you, if you're in the area, please come by. I'd love the store. I'd love to meet you. Uh, it, it'd be great. Uh, it, 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 and we'll talk birds. That's what we always say at our store. So, I just had an idea. what's that? When we travel, like we're going to be going to Ohio. Yeah. We could like try to do a little anybody around. Um, yeah, we're going to be in Ohio in the middle of June. We're going to go out there for a doctor's appointment for my daughter, uh, the University of Cincinnati, and she's saying, you know, when we're out there, we always do try to visit it a local nature center and things like that. Uh, but we will, we will let you know where we're going to be. If you live in that area and you happen to be in the area, I'd love to meet you. I really get, I love putting a face to the, and, and, and a conversation with the, the, the comments on here. Hi, Deborah. Let's see now, if you could just tell me how to convince the neighbor, she doesn't need, to, oh gosh, I am uh, like a tyrant. I run every perching cat across the area. Uh, I, front of me yeah you you believe me uh it, the cats are a really tough subject for me because um I, I i don't hate cats i really don't um i but i truly truly believe that cats belong indoors um uh, the american bird conservancy you might want to look up them deborah uh american bird conservancy has a, a a program called cats indoors and it is an education program for people and, and it and it's all facts. It's not anything anti-cat. It's all pro-cat. It's all about how much healthier cats are that live indoors. It is how much longer they live by living indoors, um, how few parasites they get. They don't get eaten by dogs or cat, dogs or owls or, um, you know, run over by cars. All these different uh, facts that try to help people convince them to keep their cats indoors. Um, and uh, house cats kill billions of songbirds. And, and, you know, I know cat people don't like it when I talk about things like this. And I, my, my son has two cats, but they're, they're indoors all the time. And, uh, they, it, and it's the responsible thing to do. Um, and for people to say they're wild animals, that is just not true. Cats are not wild animals. They're domestic cats were introduced into this country. And birds in this country have not had enough time to really, uh, in terms of getting used to predators, they, a lot of them don't even recognize cats as being dangerous. And, and so they kill tons of, of, of birds every year. So, yeah, I, you know, if you maybe contact the American Bird Conservancy and get them to send you a brochure on the Cats Indoors program, you go mail and post a link. That, that might get you some ammunition to, to be able to talk to your neighbors. It is, but I know, you know, most neighborhoods have leash laws that apply to cats as well as dogs. So that I'll give you as well. They, they do apply to cats. So, um, yeah, that's tough. Again, thank you all. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. And I'll be back on with you. Like I said, we'll post um, – Next Monday is, is, is hopefully as always on schedule and then next Thursday I do another one, but we'll be back on live in a couple of weeks and be thinking about, cause I really would love to do one coming up on everybody's favorite bird uh, and, and maybe what bird inspired you to get started in bird watching and maybe who did, maybe we, maybe we can do an interactive program on, on people's favorite birds. I'd like to do that in the future. So. All right, guys, thank you so much. You guys, like I said, have a great weekend, and we will see you next time.